And greetings, welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. Is my audio okay? Um, hope it is. Please uh, say something uh, if it's not. And if it's good, let me know. I'm testing my new USB port. It's supposed to be high speed so I can connect things. Schnoyel says audio is fine. Oh my goodness, look at everyone who's here. Uh, there is a picture of me and my dad, um, him in 1946, and then a picture of me standing on top of an airplane uh, in my flight suit and wearing a parachute. <laughs> I was uh, flying an aerobatic fighter trainer. I've, I've, people have wondered if I'm in the military. I never was. I did have, I flew one official, official Air Force mission in the Civil Air Patrol. It was Air Force airplane. I was part of the air crew and a rehearsal of a practice of a um, mission, a uh, search and rescue mission. I was in the uh, aerospace and defense industry, a software developer, really, uh, even though my degrees are in engineering, mostly. And so doing software, I had a chance to work on a lot of a variety of projects, including the FBI fingerprint identification system, uh, and, and you know, so and digital telephony. But that was only like one year when I, one or two years when I was a consultant, I got to jump around. Uh, but most of my career as an engineer was uh, in, in support of the de aerospace and defense industry. So I'm glad to hear my audio is better. I was having some problems in in one of my shows. So good greetings, to everyone here. Schnoyle from the other side of the pond, God bless you. Dan Strait, thank you. And Miss Energy, wow, look at, wow. What a nice face. Thank you for showing up here. It's an honor. And gorgeous Roddy Chrome, awesome. So I'm afraid I might put you guys to sleep. This could be a very boring session. Uh, I'm just taking a different time. So Rebecca is my normal co-host. She's one of my frequent co-hosts, not, nor you know, uh, I have a variety of co-hosts. Hermie Moyna is a graduate student in biology. He's a creationist. He comes here when he's taking a break from, oh no, I got crackly audio. Um, there's a way to get around that. I can do crackly audio. Thank you for the feedback. I'm going to get my backup system here. Let me see. Let me see. I'm going to have to disable my mouse. So thank you. Thank you for the feedback, Miss Energy. And let me see, I'm gonna go up to a backup. All right. How's the audio now? Is it still crackly? All right, so I'm going to go on on my backup uh, plan B. So this was actually a test of my enhanced USB, and it failed. I'm so brokenhearted. Uh, but thank you for the feedback. So uh, Rebecca, has, her voice is worn out. She was just talking and talking, and I think she had the allergy and a cold. Uh, it's not coronavirus because she had that um, some time ago, uh, as best as we know. So thank you. Thank you all for the feedback. I think I have to go back to the drawing board for my audio. So this is an important test on a live show. This also means it's going to be difficult for me to do a live debate. Uh, I don't know how I made it through 
Saturday, and some of you were in that debate Saturday, and I don't know how my system was handling it because the audio sounded great there. It was through Zoom, not StreamYard, and that may have helped. So let's see what's on the docket today. So it's Get Well, dedicated to Rebecca. I don't know if she, this is her dinner time out there with her family, so I don't know if she has a chance to be here. Uh, we are going to rehearse a debate. Uh, I was offered to uh, debate on this coming Friday, but that got canceled. Uh, Rebecca and I are ready to tag team, and the topic would have been um, the, the the topic would have been naturalism about naturalism. The evidence is science more compatible with naturalism uh, or not, something like that. And we would cover abiogenesis and evolution. Uh, I, I've had someone for the last two years who's just been making videos about me every other day for a while. And it was getting kind of obnoxious. It felt like a real nuisance. I, I never felt that there was much substance there, but I just kind of got irritated with, with that. And then um, I felt he insulted Rebecca a little bit and I said I have to stick up for my co-host and I said let's let's uh let's have it out once and for all and so I raised the issue up for a, a two versus two debate and he, uh, the other guy couldn't find a partner and also wanted more time and I respect that so in the process still I was deciding to uh, you know Rebecca said Sal what can I add I don't have you know I'm not qualified in all this. And I said, you'll be fine. So I'm going to give some pointers on this. And then I'm going to, uh, if she were my partner here in a tag team, or uh, there's another one, Paleo Logos, uh, I would, uh, this, so I was also inviting Paleo Logos, Peter, to uh, also be a possible partner in this. So I'm just going to give pointers that I find in the debate on origins that we can um, we can pursue. So, so that being said, so <clears throat> the first thing, the first pointer I would give to Rebecca or Peter is when the other side throws out, look at this study, look at this study, uh, this, this, uh, you know, and they'll claim in the abstract or in the conclusion that this suggests the way to the origin of life. So the first thing I'll say, okay, what does it mean it suggests? Do you remember uh, the, the famous Jim Carrey uh, from Dumb and Dumber, where he uh, he played the role of Lloyd Christmas, and Lloyd Christmas approaches Mary. He has a terrible crush on her, and said said something like this. I don't remember the exact words. Uh, Mary, what are the chances of a girl like me and a guy like you? Uh, and, and 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 Mary says, uh, not good. And then Lloyd says, not good as in like one in a hundred. And then she looks at him and it's like, more like one in a million. And then Lloyd Christmas goes, just has this look on his face, goes, so you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah. Okay. So just because there are a chance doesn't mean that something is plausible. So the first thing you'll ask is like, what are the chances of this being right? Have you even calculated the probability? Do you have any idea? And if they say, no, we, we, we don't know how, how reasonable that is. It's like, okay, that's fair. Thanks for the nice try. But at this point, it's a matter of faith, isn't it? That this was the way. You don't know that. And it's inappropriate that this should be cited as plausible. I mean, if something's a one in a million chance and you don't know that it is or not, but let's say it's a one in a million chance, is it appropriate to represent that as science when you say it suggests a pathway? I think that's not the most precise language. So this is a template for Peter and Rebecca. And Rebecca was very good at kind of hammering some of the opponents here. And I said, just refine your language just a little bit. Just say, 
what's the chance that that paper is right? And they'll say, well, we don't have any way of figuring that out. And it's like, okay, that's a start. You just admitted you don't know whether there's a good chance or not. Is that right? Or if they say, I think so, it's like on what, then you ask, you probe, on what basis have you established that there's, there's a good chance? Is it just your intuition? Is there any experiment that really makes this plausible? Because I had a show earlier where I read a paper that talked about the hand of God dilemma, the hand of God dilemma, where some of these origin of life experiments had so much human intervention, so much careful design that it's practically irrelevant to a random prebiotic soup. So um, it would be good if Peter or Rebecca would team up and I, Peter's going to be in a debate, and, and I want him to just, uh, he may be interacting with a few people. I'd, I'm going to suggest to Peter, ask that question. What's the probability you're right? What's the probability this could happen naturally? And by what I mean by naturally is how likely is this a high probability event? Okay. So now what the counter is, pe some people say, no, it's impossible to count. Uh, calculate the odds. And I beg to differ. There are some aspects that are calculatable. It deals with the binomial distribution. So let me see if I could show a picture of this. Um, I don't have it handy, so I'm going to have to add lib here. Binomial distribution uh, when we're dealing with large, with large numbers, it looks very close to the normal distribution. So let me show a picture of that. And let me show a picture of the binomial distribution. Aggravating. Apologies. Let me put this up on another screen. I have multiple computers here. Sorry, I'm just trying to coordinate it all at the same time. And we'll get it going. So this is known as the binomial distribution. It, it approximates... Uh, as we start to deal with large numbers, uh, yeah, good evening. As we start to deal with large numbers, and I'll talk about what it means when I say large numbers. Start to look like the normal distribution. So let's say, hypothetically, and this applies to the origin of life aspects of the origin of life chemistry, you can even you can even relate it to the Gibbs free energy. So the binomial distribution can actually be related to the Gibbs free energy for certain chemical reactions. Binomial distribution related to the Gibbs free energy. Those of you who've done a little bit of chemistry know are familiar with the Gibbs free energy, the probability of reaction uh, spontaneously occurring. And if the reaction happens, the difficulty of reversing it relates to the binomial. So this, when, so the first thing they'll say is no way to calculate the probability. I said, there's certain aspects you sure can calculate the probability and they'll probably tell you that reaction is not gonna happen. So let's, let, let's look at this uh, binomial distribution here. And so let's say you had 500 fair coins, 500 fair coins, all heads, and you encountered it, say, on the floor or on a table. Well, what's the likelihood that you could encounter that in the lifetime of this universe and it was through a random process? I mean, someone, if someone claimed that he just dropped all the, you know, took a jar 
with the coins, shook it up and dumped it on the table. Would you believe him if you, you know, if you saw that they're all heads? Okay, so you'll see it's all heads and it's on, on say, some dining room table like this. And, and the guy's claiming, no, I, I, I didn't do anything to make them all heads. They just kind of, kind of came out that way. W would you find that believable? And the reason you wouldn't is the binomial distribution. So let me point out a little bit here about the distribution. Hopefully you could see my cursor here. Most of the outcomes, if you randomly took a jar and shook and then poured it out on the table, most of the outcomes would be approximately 50% heads. And in three sigma, it'd be 90 some percent. I don't know the exact percent uh, the statisticians would, that it's gonna fall you know, within three sigma, three standard deviations of the mean, the mean being 50% heads, 50% tails. And, it's, and, and standard deviation for the binomial distribution, if you're dealing with 500 coins, it's it's an excess of say 11 heads or a excess of 11 tails, one standard deviation. Three standard deviations would be 33, an excess of 33 heads, so on and so forth. Um, uh, that approximation will kind of hold until you get to the extreme values, okay? So don't take it, I, I mean, Remember, I said the binomial only approximates the normal distribution. So at the extremes, it doesn't work out so well, but it still will underlie the fact you can, one, tell if something, you can calculate chemical probabilities in advance. It's, it, and you're not throwing a template. You just do not expect certain things. So you'll, you'll hear this. Um, You'll hear this sometimes where they talk about homochirality, but it's even worse than that. I'm gonna talk about consistent linkage, which is even more brutally painful application of the binomial distribution. So this is one reason why homochirality is just the first round of a difficulty. There's the next round of homolinkage in the synthesis of polymers. But let me just say this, don't let them say you can't calculate the probabilities. You can calculate some of the relevant probabilities and enough so that you could say that a particular scenario shouldn't happen. Um, and, oh, there was a question here since I have one critic. Uh, I did see William Dembski. I saw him January 22nd or so this year, January 25th, somewhere around there. It was a Saturday. It was the Discovery Institute conference. So um, yeah, Bill and I go a long ways back. There's a good chance I'll see him again, uh, perhaps not to do debates. So anyway, thank you for the, the suggestion. The so getting back to the binomial distribution, so you can calculate the probabilities. You could say this chemical reaction is not expected to happen. So if there are any questions, I'm just going to move forward. And this is kind of the unfortunate thing. If I'm doing this solo, there's not any dialogue. I have to kind of anticipate uh, what people are thinking. So... Okay, it can happen, it can happen, but um, 500 times is very unlikely. Now, so let me just take this down. So it can absolutely, and there are other things where you can apply the binomial distribution and it can also be expressed in terms of GASP, mixing entropy mixing entropy. I don't like using entropy uh, because it's it, it, it ends up being quite a mess uh, and creationists and ID proponents are, are not very schooled at it and they actually misuse it and I object to that. There is one exception in an isothermal adiabatic process. I think isothermal 
adiabatic process, uh, entropy does measure something that is uh, important. Uh, other than that, I do not want to use the second law of thermodynamics or entropy concepts. I prefer, I mean, it does relate what I'm about to show, but you don't have to use all that high powered math. You can understand this intuitively. So let's suppose we had a mix of different colored marbles or, you know, different styles. And let's say you had a bag of them and you wanted to, and they're all about, you know, uh, you could see they're all about the same shape and weight. And that's important. Let's say you had all blue marbles and all red marbles, and then you mix them up. You could see that this is going to be difficult to undo. Uh, we call that mixing entropy, that it's difficult to undo that. A lot of origin of life chemistry uses filtration to concentrate the chemicals, so you don't have uh, chemicals that uh, will contaminate the mixture. So if you're trying to synthesize a, uh, a strand of DNA, you don't want a lot of other junk in there. You'd prefer all the DNA be of one species of monomers and deoxy, yeah, there are various kinds of nucleotides, various kinds of nucleotides that could form in a, in a prebiotic soup. So how do you filter it out? How do you concentrate it so that you can make a DNA strand? The same would also be true for an RNA strand. The difficulty then of pulling this out could be also modeled by a binomial distribution. <laughs> it's going to be nightmarish. It's, it's a nightmarish scenario here. And then you can add all the chemistry and the complication. The odds become remote. And so when I hear stuff about the RNA world and they have all these papers, the first thing I would do is I would confront the origin of life researchers and say, how probable is that chemical reaction from a prebiotic soup? And they'll say, oh, well, just assuming it. It's like, okay, if you're just assuming it, why don't you assume what the probability of that is? Or do you not know? If you're going to put forward that this makes a plausible pathway, you better put a caveat there that it may not be a plausible pathway. The odds may be one in a bazillion. That would be more honest, but they don't represent it that way. And they let the science popularizers uh, promote it, um, and then they, they can get some grants. And I think that's illegitimate. So the first thing is let's you know let's let's just try to be honest about the situation. So now if we have life that first, and, and they'll say, oh, it happened in steps. It happened in steps. You know, you know, a, a little bit here, and then it's just the right thing, and then. You keep adding and I'll say, okay, what's the probability of that? Because these materials degrade. Have you calculated that? Or do you accept it by faith and intuition? You don't have any experiments. You don't have any theory. You don't have any justification, do you, that this is reasonable? You don't even know the question to Lloyd Christmas's question. You know, what are the odds? <laughs> it, it is kind of funny. He says, what's the odds of a girl like me and a guy like you? So anyway, so then, I, I just want to throw that out. This is illegitimate. We can then go to evolutionary theory, and I could point out other things like the evolution of membrane-bound organelles, particularly the nuclear membrane. It has similar issues. They don't do any calculations. So um, let's see. I'm going to, um, I see some comments and questions in there. In, in the side chat. I'm going to try to address it. First, I'll go through the docket uh, as much as I can, and then I'll go back. And by the way, here, I, I do want to say uh, Miss Energy has been so generous at Modern Day Debate. Your questions here are free of charge. Free of charge. So let's see. So we start there. So now, if we have chemistry, let's go back to binomial distribution if I could find it. If we have chemistry that is 
hanging around the tail of the distribution. And what I mean by tail, that's where the probability is really remote. So 500 coins being all heads, the probability of you observing that in this universe is so remote we would virtually consider it in the observable universe we considered it virtually impossible we call that the prob universal probability bound that's something seth lloyd developed i think each individual person will have to make a decision you know uh how improbable would something have to be before you would call it a miracle of god how improbable would something have to be before you call it a miracle of god and uh, you know, I don't know that there are any formal answers to that. Uh, I think each person has has to decide. But I'm just pointing out the probabilities can be demonstrated. Now, if you look at the complexity of the cell, and I mentioned this on Saturday, it is more complex. It is more complex than anything we could build because building things at the nanoscale is extraordinarily difficult. To and to do it with the skill and ability that you see done in biology, uh, that exceeds everything, all the technology on the planet. And we're pretty advanced at this point relative to the rest of human history, and certainly more advanced than a dumb rock or a dumb prebiotic soup. So even without getting too theological, we, we could say that whatever overcame those probabilities, not only did it overcome those improbabilities, and I pointed out it can't be overcome in a stepwise fashion for a variety of, you know, chemical decay and for a variety of things that were pointed out in the book Stairway to Life by Change Tan and Rob Stadler. Uh, in addition to that, overcoming the basic probabilities, it has a lot of technology. So whatever it did, did it, it certainly has the skill set an ability that exceeds all human technology, all intelligence, and gathered knowledge. And we don't know by how many orders of magnitude either. James Tour, a world famous chemist said, I'll, I'll tell you what, let's suppose you had a blueprint of how to build a cell. We don't, we only have blueprints of DNA and that's not a whole cell, not even close. Uh, you, you have, you, you have the, uh, you have the sugar code, which is way more complex. And we're only beginning to scratch the surface on this sugar code. We also had the membrane, um, lots of complexity there. So, and he said, I'll give you that. I'll give you all the chemicals you need. Do you think you could put it together? You have a blueprint, you have all the materials. Can you execute this? Can, can you put it together? The answer is obviously no. So whatever made the first life had a lot of intelligence, it had a lot of ability. To me, that sounds like that's a skill set of God. If, if you don't want to accept that, I respect that. So uh, that, that's all well and fine. So I've shown there the improbabilities uh, for some of the basic. Some of the stuff with calculating protein probabilities, it's on a per protein family basis. It's not as trivial as what I've done here. And I can sort of work through some of that um, where we go, where we, particularly in multimeric proteins that also have, that have interfaces and then also have binding sites, et cetera. That's a little bit challenging. So let's see what else is on the docket. So the tennis racket theorem. Okay, so uh, the tennis racket theorem, let me just read the tennis racket theorem. And there are various ways to, to frame their consequences of the te tennis racket theorem. But let me just read it from Wikipedia. And let me read some consequences of it. Let's see if I have it here. Okay. So let me bring up the tennis racket theorem. And I'll just state the form formality of it. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and try to kind of uh, parse it out so that ordinary people can understand it. So here we go. The tennis racket theorem. 
The tennis racket theorem. For intermediate axis theorem is a result in classical mechanics describing the movement of a rigid body with three distinct distinct principal moments of inertia. It is also dubbed the Zhanibikov effect after Soviet cosmonaut uh, Vladimir Zhanibikov, who noticed one of the theorem's original consequences while in space in 1985. Although the effect was already known for at least 100 years, 50 years before that. Now, the importance of this, the uh, tennis racket theorem, is it actually does apply in space when we're trying to stabilize a satellite. You know, um, if the thing's wobbling around out there in space, you don't have friction to kind of stabilize it like you do here on Earth. Um, uh, so it, it does, it has practical consequences, but let me see if I could read one of the consequences here um, of the tennis racket theorem. And it really doesn't apply specifically only to tennis rackets. It's basically the idea of dynamically unstable systems. And so when we have atoms and molecules out there, it, it, there's no guarantee stuff is, is going to be oriented in the right way to connect. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit of that. But let's, let's just go, uh, if you'll indulge me a little bit here, let me just read this. Let's just read. Let me read this. Um, I'll start kind of in the middle here. Uh, Here is where the intermediate axis theorem, the tennis racket theorem, enters the picture. While a racket spinning mostly about either the low rotational inertia axis or high rotational inertia axis will be relatively unaffected by extraneous motion about the other two axes, a racket that is spinning mostly about the intermedi intermediate rotational inertia axis is exquisitely sensitive to accidental motion about the, those other two axes. Even a tiny amount of unintended motion about those axes will cause the racket to wobble significantly. I mean, okay, so what is one of the consequences of the tennis racket theorem? And my professor, classical mechanics, uh, we learned it through Goldstein's mechanics. He took his book, he said, uh, let's see if I could flip the book a certain way and it's going to land a certain way and he couldn't get it to do that. All right. Try to flip a coin with your hand, no matter how precisely you can. Let's see if you can get it to go heads 1,000 times. You can even build a machine. It can probably toss it for a short distance, but at some point, even the slight atmospheric perturbations you know, because there's there's a, a little bit of, uh, I guess, turbulent flow in the atmosphere. When you throw it at any distance, uh, it, it starts to become unstable. And it's kind of funny. There was a paper done, an article, not a formal paper, but an educational paper. It said, you know, uh, most coins are fair. I mean, e even if hypothetically it had some bias, you, you're going to have a very hard time getting it to to keep landing consistently heads. It might have a slight bias toward heads or tails. Uh, that particular article, educational article, argued that uh, even when they were putting putty on it, and misshaping it, it was very hard to get it to, uh, you know, uh, not be a fair coin. Almost, you know, it, it usually was a fair coin most of the time. So what does that mean? Well, when you have a chemical soup and you have these atoms and molecules just bouncing around, uh, they're going to take any, any orientation. So, so even if you assume generously that you've concentrated and filtered everything out and, um, it, and it's in there and you're going to try to do a synthesis of a polymer, a, a polymer 
one form of a polymer is you take uh, one molecule, uh, one molecule, a monomer, like say a nucleotide, and you connect another nucleotide to it. And then you keep adding nucleotides and you make a string. And that string of nucleotides is DNA. Then you can also make a, a strand of RNA. So you, you can have a deoxyribonucleotide or a ribonucleotide monomer. And then you string them together and you can make an RNA strand or a DNA strand. And I call him Fumduck Farina because <laughs> he's a Fumduck. He said it's easy to make any biomolecule. So let's look at the binomial distribution here, trying to, how difficult it is. And, oh my goodness, bread of life is here. <laughs> and I'm sorry to tell you, Rebecca, for some reason when I'm running StreamYard and it's a live stream like this, last night I tested it without an audience and it was fine but uh, the audio failed again, so I'm sorry. So the real Rebecca is here. So I'm, this is the fake Rebecca here talking. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. And for those of you who don't know, um, Bread of Life is the name of the channel and Rebecca is the host and owner of that channel. So uh, everyone, let's wish, let's, uh, wish her health to her voice. Um, hey, if you're gonna get sick, let it be because you're having too much fun and hanging out and you just got worn out because you're so happy talking and interacting with people, you lost your voice. So, you know, of all the things that could get someone under the weather, I think that'd be a nice way to, <laughs> to get there. So uh, wish you well in your recovery for your voice and, um, so uh, since you're here, Rebecca, I was just giving a pointer on how to deal with the other side, especially if you don't know any, you know, if you don't know their specialty and they just read an abstract and it's so complicated, just ask them, just ask them, how sure are you that this happened, particularly for origin of life, maybe not for evolution, but for origin of life, so like, let's say it's Demeter. It's like, Demeter, tell me, how sure are you that it happened the way you said? And if he says like one in a million, yay, uh, it's like, well, no, uh, Demeter, I think you need better odds than that. Now, if he insists that it's some higher percentage, ask him, how did he do the calculations? Did you actually do a calculation or is that intuitive? Do you have any experiments or theory that show that your calculation is valid? Would you think, do any of your peers, do you think they would object to the calculation if you said it was even 10% as opposed to one in a million? You know, maybe just make it one in 10. Do you have a methodology? I would be interested to hear how they respond. If they say there's no way to calculate it, then you could say, well, then there's no way we could say that this is true. Therefore, there's no way we should be in any business saying that this is a scientific claim th that is verified for all you know, it's garbage. So if you're telling me that your theory has one in a million chance of being right, that means there's a 99%, it's 99.9999% chance it's garbage. Is that correct? Very easy. So everything that they put forward, just challenge them with that. Now it's a little harder for if you're criticizing evolutionary theory that way. So I would say, what's the probability that a selection pressure or a mutation made this? Something as complex as say the nuclear pore complex or uh, you know the import export, uh, the translocation process. How did you, what were the initial conditions? What was the probability it evolved from those initial conditions to the final state? Did you ever do a calculation? And please don't use phylogenetic methods because that doesn't answer the question of probability. You can assume for the sake of argument there's common descent in the organisms, but what's the probability from the initial starting state to the final state? And if you don't know what the initial starting state was, like let's say what 
you know, what was the ancestral protein form to say a, I don't know, a dimeric topoisomerase or a, a tetrameric, tetrameric potassium ion channel? If you don't know what the ancestor was, how can you assert that it evolved based on first principles, chemistry, and physics? And if they say, well, not, you know, that doesn't apply, I'm just like, oh, it sure does. Uh, you better uh, be able to make a compelling argument. And so that's basically how I would approach this. So, all right. So, so that was a little bit of review for uh, Rebecca and also for Peter Paleologos. So now let me go back to my slideshow. Let me see what else I have on the docket. All right, so we talked about the improbability of having purified substances. Okay, so let's say we have pur purified substances and we know that that's gonna be very, very difficult. Let's now try to take a nucleotide. All right, so to, to make a DNA, you start off with a nucleotide. Okay, so what are, the, what are the candidate nucleotides for DNA? Adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, ACTG, the DNA alphabet. So let's just say hypothetically it's floating around there in the soup. That's still a generous assumption. Already the odds of that are one in a bazillion, but you know, let's just move forward and just entertain how difficult the next step is. You got to take, just like when you're forming sentences, when you're forming words, you have to take alphabetic letters and string them together. You want to um, you want to make sentences in paragraph. You take alphabetic letters plus a space, and you basically string it together. Where if you if you treat the space as a as a character itself, that's one way to conceive of this. So so we have the English alphabet plus a space and plus some punctuation. You can make these very long strings that end up being sentences, paragraphs, chapters, books, etc. And I will point out. Um, uh, even a bacteria would pretty, uh, just the size, the amount of information that it has to store, Shannon information, it'd be comparable to a book, I think. Uh, someone check me on that if I'm wrong. Okay, so how difficult is it to put this string together? Now, if you did this, like say, by way of analogy, if you did it with Scrabble letters, if you ever played Scrabble, it's not so easy. You have to turn the Scrabble letter in the right orientation correct? Because you don't want the letters upside down or sideways. You also have a side of the Scrabble letter that's blank versus one that actually has the letter. It has to be in the right orientation. So you have a challenge there. Again, you could start to model the difficulty of putting a, together a string with the binomial distribution in terms of having it in the right orientation. So how does this relate to the tennis racket theorem? When those molecules are bouncing out there. There's you don't have a lot of control. There's a lot of uncertainty <laughs> whether it's going to be in the right orientation. So we found this out the hard way when we were trying to build synthetic DNA, that is DNA uh, from scratch. We're going to take individual nucleotides, attach them. Okay, you have one starting nucleotide, and then you add another, and then you add another. But you'll see all the steps require orientation and you have to uh, you have to connect things and then pull them off after you're done connect it to help orient it and also help connect it when you're done you pull it off and actually there are multiple steps let me just show you a little bit of the chemistry so this is dna synthesis here and um, I, I know it's not all that clear, but you could see here, this is the starting point here. And then you add th this nucleotide. Uh, 
And to do that, you first have to like pop a cap off. We call it deep protection. It has a piece of chemical that has to be removed. And then you attach that to the pre-existing DNA. And you have to do any sorts of other things like washing and removal. And that's all this. You have to get all the steps right. The recipe has to be just right to add a nucleotide. This is like adding a Scrabble letter to your word. You have to, you have to orient the Scrabble letter and then put it right beside, and then now it connects and it, it's readable. Very similar process here, but it has to be done repeatedly. In a prebiotic soup, this is like taking the Scrabble letters and just dumping it out. One, it's also very difficult for them to connect because of a um, what they call the water paradox. Okay, it doesn't spontaneously polymerize anyway, um, and if if it did, you wouldn't get nice strands like this. You'd get you start to get a mess. If it were that easy, they wouldn't have to go through this. RNA synthesis is even worse. It's it's a similar process, and let me just show you. And this is what I call thumbed up farina. He said it's easy to do this. And it's like, that's baloney. People were laughing at him. The chemists that actually understand this were just laughing that he would make such silly assertions. You know, there are even more steps with RNA. And goodness, uh, RNA has... A nat for you chemists out there, you know the difficulty of separating two isomers out. <laughs> so you get only one isomer. Uh, try to do that, guys. Seriously, try to do that. They have to do a very special SDS page or something. This is not easy chemistry, guys. It, it, this is akin. Th this is akin to the problem of when I showed you the colored marbles. So let's go back to the colored marbles example. If they're all the same shape and weight, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to separate them out. Uh, yeah, I mean, just by feel. And what can you do in chemistry? You can't just kind of look at it and say that's the right one. Let me take my tweezers and pull it out. That's pretty hard to do. Okay. So uh, this, I'm showing the improbability here. And, 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 and this is why if these guys start talking about the RNA world, don't take the bait and start trying to argue on their terms. Argue their foundations. Ask them, what's the probability that's true? Just let them answer you. Because if they give you an answer, and say it's pretty good, you know that they're not telling the truth. And if they give the honest answer that it's most likely junk and it's wrong, then how can you represent it as science? How, how can you responsibly say that there's a 99.999 chance this is wrong and you're going to represent it as good science and a likely origin of life? Wouldn't the most honest thing to say is this is likely wrong? And if you don't know that it's likely wrong, the most honest thing to say is, you don't know, but you believe. It's a face statement. That's okay. At least it's honest. All right. How does favorable Gibbs reaction and energy factor in the probability, Sal? There's a stereochemistry book that I covered on this channel it talks about homochirality. There's an associated, gives free energy going from the homochiral state of amino acids to the heterochiral state. And uh, I gave a formula on it. So that's how it relates. So anytime you have degrees of freedom or degrees of configuration, uh, there is an associated gives free energy. So if you wanted to, for, for, there will also be an associated Gibbs free energy with mixing entropy. So if you have a mix of, um, let's say, uh, one class of nucleotides that has 
quote, quote unquote, um, an undesirable uh, sugar in it or the wrong chirality uh, to purify it, there is an associated uh, mixing entropy, which results in a Gibbs free energy calculation. And I also did that there. So that's how it connects to the probabilities. Um, so with, with a homochirality going to heterochirality, uh, that is associated to the probability of, again, the binomial distribution. So going from the mean, the mean, going from the tail of the distribution, which is homochiral, to the uh, most likely distribution, the mean, has an associated Gibbs free energy, and you can uh, you could see it in my video on that. Um, so it's good you're challenging me on that. But look up stereochemistry and amino acids, you'll see a formula for that. So thank you. And let me just say hi to everyone. Thank you for the pointed question. Gorgeous. Oh, Erica uh, Hubner came here later. Hi, Sal. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you too. And Miss Energy had paid us a visit. And pigs can fly, long time no see. There's also Dan Strait. Uh, so some of the people I already said hi to, uh, like Schnoil. And God teach me to pray your word, thank you. Um, Oh, see, Schnoil said I, he'd love to see Rebecca teaming up. Yes. And Redeem Team, great to see you. Uh, thanks for being such a loyal visitor here. And Seamus Crawford. Okay. Ah, yes, the prebiotic soup, kinetic. The wishful thinking of atheists around the world, akin to a parent not telling their child that Santa Claus isn't real, and that child being 40. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Peter W., for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And bubblegum gun. And Seamus Crawford, um, I don't know if we've met. Uh, greetings. The tomato still, the tomato soup hasn't come alive. Maybe I should stir it again. <laughs> Thank you. Good one. And of course, Rebecca, bread, bread of life, and assembly of God. The Thamazo, okay. Does your formula also reveal that those unfavorable reactions decrease the probability of such complex molecules from organizing? It is one factor. So I would say a qualified yes, qualified yes. What I tried to show independent of the Gibbs free energy, um, and I don't know how, anyone would even try to do this, to do a Gibbs free energy calculation, because it's certainly not a one-step reaction. Um, you wouldn't necessarily, I, I wouldn't even know that one would try to do it, do a Gibbs free energy calculation. What's the Gibbs free energy associated with anything like this spontaneously happening in a prebiotic soup? The first thing is uh, you need purification and the Gibbs free energy is associated with purification because 
in each of these steps, you need uh, a purified environment. And going from like one step to another, uh, you have to purify, then wash, clean out the stuff, put in another, another set of chemicals. So you're having two purified reactions. You have two reaction steps where you, you have to put in one purified substance, remove it, and then put in another. Um, at that point, I wouldn't even need to use be using Gibbs free energy. I, I, at this point, I would just say that's kind of common sense that this is going to be difficult uh, to postulate this, that this could happen in a environment where you have uh, not just one class of nucleotides, but a mix. Um, that's just really hard to believe. So when they claim the RNA world, and I'm not I'm not a chemist even. Uh, I've had chemists on this channel. One time I had four PhD chemists here kind of helping me out with the chemistry. Uh, the, they're like, yeah, we try to do this in the lab. It'd be, it, it's tough. It's tough. It, we could do it in the lab, but to expect it to happen in a soup. No, you actually, that you want to have an, an anti-soup, so to speak. You, uh, it's just like, you know, um, a good analogy really is when, when you're baking a cake, uh, you want to try to, you don't throw all the ingredients all together, mix them up and just throw them in uh, the oven. Like you have to separate stuff out if it's like a multi-layer cake with icing and stuff and maybe different colors. Um, it, it's a similar thing. So I, I appreciate the, the, the strong questions here. Um, if you give me a moment, I'm going to look at the video where I talked about the Gibbs free energy and stuff. Can you give me a moment? Um, and I'm going to look it up. And this is where it's nice to have a co-host who can actually talk instead of a virtual one. Um, let me look this up for you because uh, I appreciated your interaction here. And I think I owe it to you to try to dig this up. So if you give me a moment, I'm going to try to dig it up on my channel give you the video and um, it would be from like 2021. So this is uh, way back and I'm going to uh, try to grab it for you. Just give me a moment. Wow. This is from like way, way back. This is probably like a, over a hundred videos ago, at least. So this, I'm getting back to 2000. Okay, now I'm back in 2021. It would be around, okay, so I'm back in May, June. Okay. Let me just briefly look at this. Uh, I have to make sure I'm giving you good stuff. All right, let's see if I have. And I actually will quote the book, I think. Let me make sure I can. I have a quote in the book. So thank you for your forbearance, uh, Tommaso. By the well, uh, by the way, um, thank you for thank you for visiting this channel. Okay, here it is. Here's a free energy calculation and I'm gonna share it on the screen. I'll give you also the video that this came from. I'm gonna drop it in the side chat. And by the way, if there are ways that my chemistry is a little off, but you think that I'm generally in the right direction, if you have a better way of phrasing it, I'm more than welcome to um, receive that because I'm trying, this is a great editorial uh, situation. 
And people were criticizing me in the debate for showing off books and giving references. I wanted to let people know I wasn't just making up stuff on the fly. Unlike another creationist who I whose name I won't mention because I'll get in trouble. Um, so this is the book where it, it talks about the Gibbs free energy going from uh, the homochiral state to the heterochiral racemic state. And you'll see the delta G. Delta G is the Gibbs free energy. And the formula is minus R times T ln2. And... Um, there you go. R is, I think, a gas constant. I'm a little embarrassed. I don't know what the R is. R is some um, physical constant. Um, and the book is Stereochemistry, edited by C.H. Tam. So this relates, you're asking about the probabilities. So you could see, um, see so it goes defined as the conversion of either 100% R or 100% S. That's right or left hand. I don't know why they didn't use R or L, but okay, 100% R or 100% to 50% R, 50% S. Okay, so that's like, again, the flipping of coins going from all heads to 50% heads. Again, the binomial distribution, and that's the calculation. Now, unfortunately, this is kind of just accepted. The, the guys who do, who do statistical mechanics for a living can explain how they derive that. I sort of know it. You could use Landauer's principle, and you get almost the same numbers, but not quite. I tried to do it. I have looked for how they have derived that, uh, but there is, there, is an, there is an associated Gibbs free energy in um, we know empirically uh, whether the numbers are exact or not, it's giving the right direction because if you start off with a homochiral mix, um, as, as time moves forward, depending on the temperature, it's going to flip to, to racemic. It's just the natural direction. You can also see the Gibbs free energy applied to um, even something as simple as mixing of substances that don't spontaneously segregate. So like oil and water spontaneously segregate. That, that's a different situation. In situations where they would spontaneously mix, um, that means the Gibbs free energy is favorable to an unpurified uh, substance. Okay, so I, I am, I'm very grateful, um, Tommaso, that you're looking into this. Uh, you and I speak the, the same language. I'm not a chemist. I'm, I'm just a troublemaker. So uh, my background is mostly engineering. Uh, I was, uh, you can look at my bio here on, in the about page if you want to learn more about, you know, kind of my work in, um, um, and what we do here. So a, a lot of we, what I focus on on this channel has been origin of life, evolutionary theory. There are other things for the Christian faith like archaeology and personal Christian testimony and miracles, et cetera. Uh, that are kind of important to me personally. So thank you for that. I'm going to, before I close the stream, I'm, uh, I promised I'd give you a link to this. Um, and there's a link to that video if you want to watch it. Uh, it's kind of clunky. There are a few things I probably could have said better, maybe a few mistakes. Um, but uh, my hope is that I was right enough about that the probabilities are remote. If I didn't execute it, I think it, uh, the conclusion is right, and maybe there's just a better way of phrasing it and you know correcting a few minor things. So with that, Re Rebecca, if you're if you're still there, I'm I'm glad you're hanging around. Uh, thanks. Uh, we're all wishing you well. And so let me uh, try to close out with some nice music. And it was great hanging out with you all today. And I look forward to seeing you all. It's kind of been, it's been a good time in my life, but it's challenging. And this is kind of how I have a little fun in the middle of the day.
So uh, you all take care and God bless you.